Hello, this is uh, Shackleton the Explorer, and I'm Paul Beckwith, and I'm continuing. This is part two to uh, where I'm talking about the methane fountains that have just been recently measured and uh, on the Eastern Siberian Arctic Shelf. So the water is quite shallow, 50 to 100 meters deep. The sea, uh, the sea surface temperatures are anomalously warm. The, um, you know, the warmth goes down through the water column to the sediments. So the permafrost on the seafloor is thawing and releasing methane, the organic material. Once it thaws, it's broken down by microbes and in the absence of oxygen, it produces methane. If there was oxygen available, um, like uh, near, um, near you know, wetlands, if, if you have the, the organic matter uh, breaking down and, and it's near the surface, um, you know, on the land, etc., then you can get CO2 produced with uh, aerobic decomposition, but it's called anaerobic decomposition if there's no oxygen available. So this is a case on the, in the sediments on the seafloor. So I'll just continue talking about, you know, this, this, this record high levels of methane up to 16 parts per billion. Normally we measure methane in, 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 uh, in parts per billion, you know, and uh, I'll talk about the global averages in the atmosphere and what we're seeing, you know, to put it sort of in context with what we're seeing um, in the Arctic. So let me get right back to my images. Sorry, Shackleton, he's a bit, a bit annoyed at me now for some reason. We'll have to get the treats for him. Okay, so this is an article that just came out today. There's been lots of press in the last few days. And this is global news, you know, and there's, uh, so basically, you know, they're calling it a methane fountain. You know, the, there's bubbles in the water of the methane. It's coming up from the sediments you know, up through the water column, up into the, into the air. Um, okay, the discovery is unlike anything they've seen before. And again, it's Igor Similitov. Okay, so permafrost is ground that is permanently frozen for at least two years in a row. You know, it can be frozen for tens of thousands of years. There's huge amounts of permafrost, 8.7 million square miles in the northern hemisphere. Okay, when it begins to, when it thaws, um, you get the organic material begins to break down by the microbes and that releases emissions of carbon dioxide and methane to the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide if there's oxygen present and methane if there's no oxygen present. Okay, um, so, you know, yeah, so basically that's, that's where we're at. Okay, um, let's have a look now at the atmospheric, basically I, I would go to Google, go to Google Images, I'm looking at atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations 2019, and as I scroll through the, down through the images, um, I found this, this is a very good figure, and I think this is one of the most up-to-date ones. So I expanded it here. So here's CO2 increasing. This is from um, the early 80s, and you can see the seasonal fluctuation. Um, and you can see, you know, the smooth line goes up, and you can see how it, it's not linear. It's actually increasing at faster and faster rates. Methane was rising strongly initially and then tapered off and was flattened out here in the 2000s. 2007 started to uptick and now it's actually increasing um, faster than linearly. This is nitrous oxide. Okay, and if you look at the, if you take basically the red line and you take the slope of the red line, the derivative, you know, in calculus, basically just the slope, this is the CO2 value here, and this is the methane. So the slope was decreasing, the line was flat here, you know, and there were some parts where it was actually dropping slightly. So this is a zero line, the slope was, you know, negative, the line was actually going down. 
and then it you know 2007 sharp uptick okay and now you know the trend is going up here you know big increase here um, okay so the trend is is upwards now this is an this is another image so this is um, up to May 13th, 2019, from the year 2000. So you can see CO2 and atmospheric methane. So these, this is a global, um, this is at Mauna Loa, uh, Hawaii. So right in the middle of the ocean. Um, so this is one of the standards for measuring these greenhouse gases. And you can see a level of 1884 parts per billion. If you put this into parts per million, it would be 1.884 parts per million. And to give you an idea, you know, um, in the Arctic, you know, these Russian scientists in the Titanic uh, ship, the ship that was used to the Titanic ship, the, the research ship in the Titanic movie that went to find the Titanic and um, monitor it and... Uh, you know, send down these Mir 1, Mir 2 submersibles down to the ship. That same ship that was used in the movie um, is the, the movie that the Russian scientists, um, is the ship that the Russian scientists uh, um, finding the, these methane fountains um, used. Okay, um, now what's the global warming potential of methane compared to CO2? And you see all kinds of different numbers here. Again, I'm Google, in Google Images, I'm just doing this search, global warming potential of methane compared to CO2. You know, and you see numbers like, you know, 21, 22, 25. This is over a 100-year time frame. And then you see numbers like, uh, you know, there, it's all over the map here for, for methane. Um, 20 years, 42 to 70. Uh, 16 to 26, 20 years, 20 years. This is clearly wrong. <laughs> this is this should be 100 years here. Uh, methane, there you go, 21. That you know, 100 year time scale. Anyway, it's it's all over the map here. So I go. I want to get the IPCC numbers, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the AR5 Working Group One. This is table 8.7. If you get look, get look at the whole document, you can find, you know, this. This is basically from what I did is I narrowed my search to IPCC, AR5, global warming potential of methane compared to CO2. And I scrolled down and I found, uh, you know, this from the Climate Emergency Institute. And I trust those numbers. This is P Dr. Peter Carter's, uh, one of his great sites. And this is one of his slides here. So the AR5 global warming potentials and the lifetime. So this is the, the number that I believe to be correct. The global warming potential is 86 times that of CO2 over a 20 year time scale. And it's 34 times over a 100 year time scale. So, you know, the IPCC number was originally 21 and then evolved to 25 and then the most recent number is uh, 34 times. It's apparently, you know, there's some confusion in how to measure it. Anyway, it's 34 times over 100 years, 86 times over 20 years. On the time scale of a year or two, it's between 150 to 200 times, to the best of my knowledge. Okay, so, you know, when we talk about 16 parts per million of methane to convert to the CO2, equivalent value you'd have to multiply by these factors you know for this time scale so you know it's basically huge okay so um yeah okay so so basically we have a you know the methane is starting to come up from the uh, from the seafloor okay um as you now Remember that the the main factor that um, destroys. Okay, I'm going to turn the camera back here. Okay, so let's chat a little bit about what's going on. Okay, so the main factor 
with um, the main factor that removes methane from the atmosphere. The lifetime of methane is about 12 years or 11 years or 10 years or nine years. It's basically given as about nine to 12 years. And the reason why there's a large variation is not really talked about too much, but the main, there's a lot of water vapor up in, in the atmosphere and H2O, a hydrogen is pulled off and it leaves you with OH minus. And it's the OH minus radical, you know, it's called a radical, it's a charged um, molecule, okay? It's got a negative charge. It's extremely reactive in the atmosphere. So it'll go and stick to molecules and break molecules apart. So it does that to CH4, methane, okay? so. So if there's a lot of water vapor in the atmosphere, like near the equator, for example, you know, very hot, very humid, lots of, lots of evaporation, lots of water vapor in the atmosphere. So, so a certain percentage of that is broken down to the OH minus. So it really attacks and shortens the, you know, takes out methane, you know. So the lifetime of methane near the equator would be very, very short. It would be, you know, nine years, maybe even a bit less. You know, that's the nine to 12 is sort of like a global average. So methane from wetlands, you know, is increasing near the equator, but it's taken out very quickly in the, in the atmosphere. Now, when you go to the Arctic, it's very, very cold and very, very dry. And because it's dry, there's not much H2O water vapor in the atmosphere. So there can't be much OH minus. So therefore methane produced in the Arctic lives for, lasts for a longer time if it was to stay up there. Of course, there's global circulation movements of the air, but it does take time for air, you know, circulating in the Arctic to move to lower latitudes. So, you know, the, comp the, the picture uh, is quite complex, but the point is, is we're getting huge amounts of methane starting to come out of the permafrost, both on land and on the seafloor. And this is uh, creating a big problem um, for, for uh, you know, this is contributing significantly to, to climate change. Um, so let's talk about a couple other things that are happening. You know, a number of years ago, you know, these are just some sort of random thoughts. Um, you know, quite a while ago, I've done a lot of videos on wildfires, you know, and covered the California wildfires, Fort McFurry wildfires, etc. You know, when wildfires are burning hotter and they're covering more regions and, you know, they're so hot, the convective uplift can actually go right up into the stratosphere, putting some ash there. Um, but right now what's going on in California is Okay, so in California, PG&E, the electrical company, had, had faulty um, transmission lines and their poles weren't strong enough. So when there would be Santa Ana winds, you know, high winds, it would blow over the, the, the um, power lines. They'd spark, they'd cause the wildfires. So PG&E went bankrupt a couple of years ago. I guess they're in re receivership. And we're, we're experiencing these winds right now in California. So to preempt the starting of fires, they've actually shut down the power grid, you know, to maybe up to a million homes. And some people, you know, it started tapering off Wednesday, I believe, you know, people had a day's warning, that's it. And some people may not have power until Tuesday. This is clearly not a solution. This is an absurd way of dealing with the issue. Um, and uh, what else is going on? One of the things, projects that you could do, maybe put it in the comments, is, you know, how much are fossil fuels being subsidized? A report came out for Canada, and on a per capita, per Canadian basis, the subsidies are $1,640 uh, per Canadian. Each ca Canadian's on average emit 15 tons of CO2, so if you do the division, that's a price of a subsidy price of about $110 or so um, per, per ton. And, you know, the government has put in a subsidy of $20, but clearly, you know, when you, you subsidize to 110 and have a $20 price, some, 